I'm Jake. I'm Tom. We are Velocities in Music. On this podcast, Tom and I discuss a bucket of topics pertaining to modern music, including artist deep dives and monthly and annual new music wrap-ups. Another month of 2017 is in the bag. It's time to reflect back on the albums that came out in February 2017. Today we'll cover a short list of featured February releases in depth, plus we'll give you a brief run-through of honorable mentions and albums we didn't recommend from the month. Before we get started, you can help support Velocities in Music. Subscribe to Velocities in Music on your favorite podcasting device to automatically get our latest podcast episodes sent to your device for your listening pleasure. Also, Velocities in Music doesn't want your money. We also don't want to introduce any ads into the podcast yet. Right now, all we want is for you to share Velocities in Music with family or friends whom you think would benefit from joining in on the music discussion Tom and I try to create in each podcast episode. A lot of albums came out this month, Tom. Yeah, short, it was rich. Short month, a lot of albums. Yep. A lot of albums. Now, I got to say, reflecting back on the month here, I didn't really feel like there was a ton of strong releases. No. A few key ones, but but on average, I would say January was a much stronger month. Well, should we dive in? Yeah, let's do it. Start with some in-depth analysis of a few featured albums. Let's do that. For our first featured album of February 2017, we're going to start with Elbow's new one. Little Fictions. I've listened to this a few times, and it's still growing on me, I feel like. But, but overall, this has some of the great moments we can expect from El- Elbow. Uh, but with, for me, none of the consistency we've come to expect. Things sound a little bit sterile and without space, like, like almost like Danger Mouse produced it. He didn't produce it. But, but that was actually one of the first things I checked, is I was like, did Danger Mouse produce this? I don't know. There also just aren't really any of the huge emotional climaxes that Elbow's so good at. And because of that, most of the melodies fall a little bit flat and feel lacking in purpose. This is still a good album, I would say, but but it's the first time I've ever felt even slightly disappointed in the band. Now, now keep in mind, this is pretty biased. This is coming from an Elbow Mega fan mm-hmm. here. Uh, and this album still is growing on me, but I, I'm, I'm just having a little bit of a struggle with it. Yeah, I struggled with it at first, too. I've listened to this probably like seven or eight times oh, wow. now. I've just, okay. I've just put it on, you know, throughout the month. It came out at the very beginning of February. And uh, I, I did notice right away that they seem to be edging more towards an electronic sound, and mm-hmm. they're matching that by changing up their production style to be sure. much more clean cut. Everything sounds very pristine and sparkly. Uh, and, and that kind of bothered me at first, but the more I listen to this, the more I, I really connect with, with Guy Garvey's vocals, um, mm-hmm. which, Tom, as you know, like that's that's kind of the way I emotionally connect sure. to music. So um, I think I've started to like this a little bit more than you. I also think that this album does have a lot of uh, that emotional depth. I cannot get enough of the title track, track nine, Little Fictions. Yeah, that's a great one. It's almost eight and a half minutes long, and it's it kind of, it tells this like, story um but but it's it's not telling a story so much in the lyrics and that as the whole song kind of grows and builds into this climactic ending point it it just it, it like grows with the lyrics too so the whole thing kind of just comes down as this like cascading emotional roller coaster that you're on and it, and it depicts you know the the you know the turmoil and changing uh relationship that he's describing in this song and i think that that's just a a really cool special idea and a great way to kind of start closing out the end of the album i really like the back half of this record and thought that like the more that i get into it the more that i'm really appreciating this as a full album listen but i still wouldn't rank this above any of elbows like first five albums yeah i agree for our next featured album from February 2017, we have Sampha Process. Sampha Sisse is a British musician, singer songwriter, producer, um, and Process is his first debut record, and I'm well, hopefully only debut record. Uh, but <laughs> I got what you mean. Yeah, there's it, a comma in there. Yeah, it, there was definitely a strong comma. <laughs> um, this reminds me a lot of a more like R&B frame James Blake. The production is driven by 
piano and atmospheric muffled beats. Some of the songs lack a certain structure that I was looking for, but not in a in a good way. They sort of meander between lingering electronic swirlings and disconnected vocals. I like this album overall and definitely recommend it, mainly for Samfa's vocal presentation and the somewhat original presentation of the overall sound. Yeah, I really like the sound as well, and, and in particular, I really like the really soul-bearing confessional lyrics. I think they pair well with the performance and style and the whole production style basically the full package my only complaint about this one is i felt like it was pretty front heavy the first four or five tracks for me were the clear highlights and then the rest was fine but but never really lived up to that starting point next up we have the new jessica hoop album memories are now This, this was, I'll just come out and I'll start with this. This is by far my favorite album of the month. Yes. I, I love this album. You know, Jake, you and I, we we listen to a lot of music. We talk about a lot of music and, and we go through it and, you know, it's easy to just when you have a slew of albums that are, are pretty good but middling. Sure. That you just kind of listen to them once and you're like, yeah, that was nice and you move on to the next. Albums like this are what I live for and what we do on this show. I agree. Because... When I, I love that that after the the hundreds and thousands of albums that we've listened to over the course of of keeping velocities and music going, that I can still run into albums like this that I just become obsessed with. Yep. That I just want to listen to nonstop. They, and memories they beckon are now, you back. They do. I like. I had to listen to this. Yep. Like I and I finish it and I just want to listen to it again. Uh, this is this this is a Jessica Hoop. She's a female singer songwriter, but blends a lot of styles in to her music. Uh, there's some folk in there. There's some Americana, uh, some kind of art rock. Uh, track two on this album, her vocals remind me a lot of like Kate Bush. But then also you have some what I would call like 2000s PJ Harvey thrown in there. Uh, they're also like if you're a fan of Joanna Newsom or Joni Mitchell. Or uh, Anais Mitchell, like all of these artists, like she, yeah, if anyone with the name Mitchell, you'll you'll probably like this. No, but it's just every single song is different and approaches a different style, but still comes together to make a cohesive album. And plus, just every damn track is a highlight. It's just I, I th- this is gonna be hard to beat. I respect the hell out of an album that can show diversity both in sound and in songwriting, yet remain remain a cohesive listening experience. Mm-hmm. And and Jessica Hoop does exactly that on this record. This album bounces around from, as you were saying, Tom, like I hear alt, alt country, mm-hmm. I hear folk, I hear Americana, singer songwriter, and it does it effort, effortlessly. Hoop's vocal presentation is the X factor on this record, in my opinion. Her her vocal intonations and flourishes give the sound an edge and a personality, and her lyrics are really great, too. Several of these songs embrace a more cathartic, morose sound, um, and, and I think that that really works to make the album more emotionally diverse. Mm-hmm. This, like I was saying earlier, it, it like kept calling me back. Like I would just randomly have these cravings to listen to the record. And I do think that that's something special um, when a record can do that. And, yeah. and not every record, like some great records that we listen to every year will do that. Um, and, and some uh, don't. Yeah. And, and what's interesting about this one is like, I don't think that from a scope perspective that Memories Are Now really does like accomplish as much that it would actually warrant that, but it has something special in it that just calls you back. Next up, we have another debut from Danish dream pop Mm. group, Lowly, and the album is called Heba, I think, Heba, Heba, Heba. We're going to go with Heba. If Tegan and Sarah sounded more like King of Limbs era Radiohead, I think you would have a similar sound to what Lowly is presenting here on Heba. The female vocals are pretty fantastic, powerful, yet smooth and endearing. The composition is comprised of mostly electronic elements, synths, keys, some in the swirling loops, and some taking on a huge dynamic presence commanding the mix, all while playing off the vocals. There are some great beats throughout this record as well. The more 
more I listen and let it play on, the more that this album sucked me in further. I really enjoyed this one. Yeah, I really liked the electronic backings in the instrumentals and everything that's setting up the sound. But I think you're spot on when you say that those really are just to reinforce the vocals. Like right. The vocals are, are the focus. And this one took me a few listens for that reason, but it really grew on me after several listens because that's what I ended up really connecting with in the sound. Our next featured album is the new Dirty Projectors album, self-titled Dirty Projectors. Dave Longstreet, the leader of this band, uh, we find him in a very precarious point in his life on this self-titled Dirty Projectors album. Uh, he'd recently broken up with fellow bandmate Amber Kaufman, and so this album clearly is dealing with that kind of personal struggle. Um, but aside from that, it also deals with kind of an identity crisis musically. He's changed the sound a lot, moves to more of an R&B-focused sound, very electronica, a lot of manipulation and effects on the vocals. Um, it's it's not really smooth R&B, though. I think that's something we're seeing a lot these days is that R&B has a tendency to be very smooth in the presentation. This is still just as disjointed and collage-like as anything that you would expect from Dirty Projectors, but uh, just with a different kind of so uh, sound palette and instrumental palette driving it. Uh, I wasn't really huge on this right at first, but I'll definitely come back to it. it it's, it's a weird album, and it's a lot to take in. Yeah, the album I would consider it closest to is the the new Boney Bear album from last year. Yeah. Um, just in, in how much it focuses on the presentation of the production. And I think that this album dabbles so much into electronica in its composition with all the tons of samples and electronic melodies that you hear that it's hard to call this anything other than electronica, though the vocals tend to follow themes of R&B. Uh, this, this album is all over the place sonically, something that isn't foreign for Dirty Projectors, as you said, Tom, but, th but this record lacks the fullness and lushness of their previous records, probably from losing their guitarist. It feels colder and more desolate while still creating an intricate sonic landscape. That alone is an accomplishment. The fundamental issue I hear in this record is, is simple disparity. Some songs came together and work really well, and others didn't, and it makes for a disjointed, convoluted listen at times. Next, we have the 16th studio record crazy. from American singer-songwriter Ryan Adams. The album is called Prisoner. Tom... I love Sour Patch Kids. Yeah, me too, man. I think Sour Patch Kids are like one of the best candies ever. I mm -hmm. can sit there and like I'll, I'll get like one of those five pound bags and I can just put them all in a bowl, a sugary, lovely bowl, and I can just eat them and eat them and eat them. Is, is, I got to ask, is this payback for the, for the Metallica steak thing? Because the fact that you're talking about this and you had the gall to not bring any Sour Patch Kids pissing me off a little bit right now. <laughs> Way to totally distract me. Sorry. <laughs> so the thing that I find about when I'm enjoying a gigantic five pound bowl of, of Sour Patch Kids is that after the first pound, pound and a half, they start to stick to my teeth. I start to get like just kind of sick to my stomach oh, because yeah. I've had the same thing. I mean, they're different colors, but the different colors of the same thing, right? They're still yeah. sugar coated, very, very yeah. just straight sugar and gummy form. And I can't help but just want to throw up after a while. <laughs> that is the same thing as the new Ryan Adams album, oh, Prisoner. All right. That is the same thing. I don't want to say that this album is for formulaic, but there are some striking similarities song to song that cause this album to lose some of its dramatic effect, which it seems to strive very hard to achieve. Ryan Adams must only know one vocal melody because that's all he's willing to use, especially on this record. Each of these songs follow relatively a simple song structure with similar instrumental compositions, electric guitar, acoustic guitar, bass and drums, very simple, and production in this arena-style Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers sort of feel. Still, you can't deny that these songs are very well-written and well-performed. Uh, Ryan Adams is very well-established at this point and knows what he's 
he's doing. I wish that there was more variety on Prisoner. That would make this album truly great. As it is, it's still a fairly strong album. I just have to dock it a few points and probably won't come back to it as much for just how formulaic I felt that this was. Yeah, Ryan Adams, you know, he's he's not the king of originality. And especially, you know, over a 16 studio albums over the course of, what, 17 or 18 years, he's a prolific guy, and it's not necessarily something that he hasn't done before. Uh, but I, th- I think you're right. I think that he still does have a lot... Um, he has a lot of just quality songwriting to offer the world, and I think that he owns his style pretty well. This, similar to Dirty Projector's album, is another breakup album, right. too, and I think that we often find when artists are, are doing breakup albums, you know, you, you hate to see someone going through, you know, personal turmoil and pain like that, but, you know, it makes for a lot of good art sometimes, and I think that where uh, Prisoner, the new Ryan Adams album, while it's probably not going to go down in history as one of the best albums ever, maybe not even one of his best albums, uh, but I think that that where it does succeed is it does have a lot of that authentic emotion driving it, which isn't really present in all of his stuff. For our last featured album of February 2017, we have the new Sun Kill Moon album, Common as light and love are red valleys of blood. Next we got me leaving baby slightly, but not so sadly. Gonna see many pack that certified against Timothy Bradley, where I predict many will lose by decision. Suffering with a fourth five brains bastion is hanging around to keep winning. Then I'm going down to New Orleans. This album, first off, the, the, the most notable feature of this album is it is a beast. It is 16 tracks and over two hours long, averaging at about eight minutes per track eight minutes per track this is a huge album uh it's for me it was really great at any given moment i can't pick out a song and just say this song is trash you know all the songs are good um but none of them really justify their length and a ways into the album the tracks kind of stop justifying their own existence because they don't necessarily accomplish anything different than the ones that came before them it's just the same emotional resonance achieved through a similar but different story I think the sound choices are interesting, especially the fact that uh, Mark decided to use bass guitar as kind of the main instrument here. Mm -hmm. I just really wish he would have spent as much time developing the musical variety as he did clearly on the lyrics. He he spent a lot of time on the lyrics. Now, by the end of this thing, I ended up liking it more than I thought I would a few tracks in just because it's such an experience. You know, I can't say I loved this album and I still would have liked for it to be shorter, more focused and and justify its own length a little more. But, but man, I mean, at at the same time, you kind of have to give your hats off to the guy just for pulling off such a monstrous beast of an album. Yeah. This, this is an album I respect more than I enjoyed. I think that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the songs on common as light and love are red valleys of blood. I mean, just the title alone, you knew this was going to be, just a huge Mm -hmm. monolith of an album but most of these songs consist of that beefy bass groove which i thought was a really interesting choice Mm -hmm. Um, minimalistic drums and storytelling often even diary reading vocals which that kind of adds that personal element to it um and and just fantastic i gotta say fantastic production on this yeah i i have never heard bass guitar sound so huge Mm-hmm. Sound. I mean, it was just it, it was probably the highlight of the album for me. The sound is is unique and original. The concept is really cool and the lyrics can be thought provoking at mm-hmm. times. But you take any defined set of these ideas and stretch them out over the track average track length of eight minutes and it's going to get old. And it does. The album drags on. The songs drag on within themselves. The songs aren't different enough from one another for the album not to drag on. Simply put, there isn't anywhere close to enough content here to justify two hours and nine minutes of music even if the sound and ideas are good so i that fundamentally makes me not like this album as much even though i respect the hell out of it for the statement that it makes yeah and you know given the lyrics so mark clearly has a fascination with with tragedy um societal and cultural problems He's a poet. yeah and and also also like true crime he mentions that on the sure. album he loves true crime a uh, kind of mankind's gritty grisly mm-hmm. past and underbelly right uh, and i think that that's really potent in short bursts 
but it gets to a point where I think it starts to backfire mm-hmm. and it actually loses its impact on the listener. Yeah, you're just kind of a downer at that right, point. Right, right. At that point, it's like, man, how much more could you possibly pack right. into it? I think there's a point at which you can cut it off and really leave the listener feeling what you wanted them to feel. And sure. I think that he he kind of beats it to death yeah, by the art, end of this. Art is supposed to make you think. And, mm-hmm. if, and if they're like taking it too far over the top that it loses its meaning, it's self-defeating. Yes, So that wraps up the featured albums from February of 2017. Now, as we have for the last couple of monthly wrap-ups, we're going to dive into the honorable mentions for the month. So we'll just briefly mention uh, a slew of albums. We have a good list this month of of albums that we thought were worth bringing up to you guys for you just to kind of comment on uh, their their, overall qualities and let you guys decide for yourself if you want to go check them out. To start with, we'll go with Eliza Carthy, Big Machine. This is British alternative pop rock. Uh, Some nice tunes on this record, but nothing overly original or ear-catching. Next up, we have the Menzingers, After the Party. This is pop punk that comes off as much more authentic than many of its contemporaries or peers. Overall, while these guys don't really have the level of depth I'm looking for in uh, in my style of rock music that I like, uh, they do write good songs and they perform them really sharply. Next, we have Moon Duo with Occult Architecture Volume 1. This is kind of post-punky electronica along the lines of Liars, but not as abrasive. This has a lot of similarities to jam band music, except with some loosely structured verses and choruses towards the beginning of the songs. Moon Duo makes sure to include extended sections for spacey, driving, and experimental exploration. Lots of textured synths and other electronic melodies here. Driving, repeated drums, airy, spacey male vocals. The whole thing feels like this constant loop. Next up, we have Duke Garwood, Garden of Ashes. Let us trade a tale of wrong and good gone bad. There's a slow moving, grooving blues that you can really bob your head to. There's an undertone to this that's both sinister and serene, and I find it somewhat enchanting and mystifying to listen to. Vocally, Duke falls somewhere between Nick Cave, Michael Gira of Swans, and Leonard Cohen, uh, but more subdued than any of those artists. Next up, we have Black Joe Lewis and the Honey Bears with the album Backlash. This is American blues with a little bit of funk influence. This album has a great, definitive live band sound, like something you would hear at an above-average nightclub that is trying to be hit but is clearly catering to baby boomers reaching for their extended youth. The instrumental performances are about what you'd expect here. Bluesy electric guitar, driving funky bass, drums, and a horn and sax section. The male vocals do a great job performing. They add a nice energy to the mix. This really isn't that original of a sound, but it's very well done and decently enjoyable if you're into this type of music. Next up, we have the Sadies with Northern Passages. This is country rock with kind of a spacey edge to it, really repetitive electric guitar melodies, a hint of like 80s alternative rock like R.E.M. from time to time. Uh, This didn't do a whole lot for me, Jake. I think you liked this one a little bit more than I did. Smidge. Um, Yeah, just a little bit. Uh, For me, I felt the vocals were really lacking in spirit and conviction, and that mixed with the somewhat thin production made this a little difficult to devote my attention to, but still a, a pretty good album nonetheless. Next up, we got Chuck Prophet with Bobby Fuller Died for Your Sins. This is bluesy rock with country and southern flavor to it. Overall, the songwriting really didn't feel that inspired to me. It seems fairly stock. There isn't anything particularly offensive about the music here. It's just underwhelmingly safe. Yeah, I think I like this one a little bit better than you, Jake. Just a Uh, smidge. It reminded me a little bit of Beck in the vocals and attitude, but... 
but he doesn't really create as much of a likable persona or do anything as original as Beck does. I still found myself enjoying this, but probably not enough to really come back to. Next up, we have Tinaruin with their album Elwan. I really hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, this name means deserts, and this group originates from the Sahara Desert. Uh, now, we're far from experts in world music here, so you know this is going to be a pretty niche listen. It's probably for a lot of people. There are elements of blues here and also folk infused to the more traditional, uh, worldly-sounding electric guitar and, and hard drum beats. The vocals have that tribal sense to them and are often accompanied by a similar-sounding back and chorus. This is really an interesting, engaging, unique listen, and, and in particular, I actually really like the electric guitar work on here. Next, we have Noveler, a pink sunset for no one. This is ambient and drony with repeated reverbed guitar notes. It gets a little dreamy at times with a mostly production effects. Overall, a very nice sound worth checking out if you're into this sort of style, ambient, a little bit of post-rock edge electronica. I really love the moods that Noveler created here with great representation of this style. Our next album is Los Campesinos with their album Six Scenes. I didn't like this one quite as much as their previous album, No Blues. But this band still does a great job of crafting endearing pop melodies. While I would call the core of the writing pop, though, they pack a lot of raw emotion into the performances and incorporate rather heavy subject matters into the lyrics. This combination of styles is what sticks with me about this album, but that dedication to catchy melodies is also what prevents them from really allowing their message to strike gravity with the listener. Next up, we have the third album from King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard in the last year and a half. The album is titled Flying Microtonal Banana. This one is less energetic, less frenetic, and sadly also less memorable than Nonagon Infinity, their album from last year. They're mixing some eastern sounds into the music, which serves their style pretty well. Still a good listen, and if you're into this wave of psychedelic garage prog, definitely check this record out. Our next album is a self-titled debut from supergroup Crystal Fairy. Crystal Fairy, this the, this band has members of, of several big acts, actually. A couple guys from the Melvins, Omar Rodriguez Lopez from At the Drive-In, and Mars Volta, uh, as well as Terry Genderbender from La Butcherettes. This is kind of jammy, thrashy, stoner metal. The, the songwriting, vocals, and general style point to a heavy like Rush influence, but you, you also certainly hear the bands that each of these members come from in the style as well. This gets pretty experimental. Uh, no surprise, because these guys aren't afraid to, to tres, test drive some interesting ideas. Uh, the production is iffy, though, and, and I think that bothered you a little bit more than it bothered me, Jake. I think I, liked, I think I like this much better than you did. Um, for a super group, you know, I think they did a pretty good job of blending their various backgrounds and fortes into cohesive sound. However, that doesn't mean it feels perfected. I think this is a good start for the group and I hope they keep playing together because they could polish it up a bit more and really do something great. Uh, I at least like this a lot more than Bosnian Rainbows, but I remember you liking that album a lot more than I did. Next, we have The Feelies with their album In Between. This is timid, pondering acoustic rock with exceptionally soft male vocals. Bright acoustic guitar chords over minimal drumming and light bass with some quiet electric backing guitar is the main sound you hear. The sound is endearing. It hits you right in the feelies, but save for a couple of strong oh, save for a couple of strong tracks, this album seems fairly dismissible. However, there seems to be a lot of subtlety here, so it might be worth rev a revisit or two. Our next honorable mention is Lawrence English with Cruel Optimism. Yeah. 
This is probably some of the most engaging ambient music I've heard since Low Skills album from last year. There's a lot of dynamic highs and lows, but all the elements blend very well together to make one cohesive wave of a sound. I really like this one. Next we have Clap Your Hands Say Yeah with... Yeah! Thank you, Tom. <laughs> Clap Your Hands Say Yeah with The Tourist. I was a big fan of Clap Your Hands Say Yeah's debut album, self-titled. It came out mm-hmm. in 2005. I remember really digging into that one. Some Loud Thunder came out in 2007, liked it okay. I haven't really followed the band since then, so I was really excited when The Tourist came out this month. Um, this is kind of a more mature version of Clap Your Hands. These songs are reaching for an emotional depth through the use of subtle builds and dynamic contrast, something I really enjoy. Guitar and bass are shrouded in electronic effects. You either are going to love this guy's vocals or you're going to hate them. They're polarizing, high-pitched, and squelchy. The songwriting and instrumentation could be more impressive, but I find that this is pretty nicely crafted and enjoyable. Next up, we have Molly Birch with Please Be Mine. This to me sounds somewhere between Beach House, Colts, and Sharon Van Etten. There's a dreamy quality, but the unwavering lyrical focus on herself and her relationships anchors Molly's music very much in the here and now, giving the sound an ethereal quality that isn't really matched by the songwriting. She performs it very well, though. It's just that I don't think that this style is is really being reimagined here. It's being done a lot these days, and in my opinion, being done better uh, by other artists. Next, we have Moi, or Mori, with No Future. This is Electronica. You can tell that this takes a lot from early Aphex Twin, but with a lot more of Clubber House, or perhaps even Clubhouse vibe. There's some good stuff here, but my biggest complaint is that the album is just too darn long, and more specifically, the tracks are too long. I'm okay with Electronica albums if there are a lot of tracks, and therefore more ideas, but 12 tracks in 57 minutes, these tracks just run long without exploring enough space. I think this album would sound much more engaging if the beats weren't so unapologetically repetitive. Next up, we have a new album from The Next with Unfold. This is more ambient music. We got a lot of that this month, and it's really pretty good stuff. There's actually almost an avant-garde kind of jazz feeling to this between the fluttering piano and string bass, but then there's percussion that provides a windy, mysterious backdrop uh, that that just kind of floats around rather than necessarily holding down the beat. Uh, This edges more towards that that Tim Hecker side of atmosphere and mood, if that's what you're looking for. Um, But like I said, a lot of auxiliary percussion, almost Captain Beefheart-ish in the way that it's a little bit arrhythmic and odd. Uh, this This has this mystique creepiness to it, and I really like that, but, you know, Four tracks. This is almost an hour and, and 15 minutes long, so it's a long one, but if, if you like that kind of sound, I think you'll find this one to be rewarding. Next, we have Juju with Forget. <sighs> Nothing too surprising here if you're familiar with Juju's particular brand of apocalyptic synth-driven despair. There's a bit less aggression on this album than what we've heard from them in the past, but just as much hopelessness, and conveyed through a very similar sound. I don't see as much of a progression on this record, but more of a reminder that this band is as strong as ever and isn't going away anytime soon. Next up is a new album from PVT, or Pivot, New Spirit. I show a ball of question, a feeling you can find this, a feeling you can find this. This is electronic based and glitchy. It reminds me a bit of Ye Sayer's darker side albums like uh, Fragrant World. Uh, mixed with some Sons and Liars. This is good, but for me, not really anything more than that. If you like that sound, check it out. Our next honorable mention is Dutch Uncles with Big Balloon. I'm not previously familiar with this band, but they sounded to me like if Wild Beast or Hot Chip 
took a more new wave or slightly post-punk approach to their music. Specifics aside, though, at its heart, it's just fairly poppy rock music. Our next album is Peter Silberman of Antlers with his new album, Impermanence. First off, apparently this album's being classified as an EP. I don't know why in the world you would consider a 36-minute album to be an EP, but but okay, that aside. I, I Maybe it's just because the minimal approach of the music, what this really is, is just uh, you know a lot of stripped-down electric or acoustic guitar uh, with Peter's mournful yet soothing crooning uh, over that bare backdrop. It's, it's a really effective mood piece, but as actual songs... The tracks didn't do a whole lot for me. I know that he's capable of something more varied and time efficient as well, and that's kind of what I wish this would have been. Next, we have Sherwood and Pinch with Man vs. Sofa. First off, what a great band and album name. I like it. It sounds like these guys sound like a furniture maker. And then <laughs> Man vs. Sofa sounds like the crappy podcast that they would put together <laughs> to try to market their sofa. This is somewhat dancey electronica with sinister undertones that, with a good use of samples. Uh, I enjoyed this for, throughout. Um, this had a lot, a lot of like samples and found sounds and mm-hmm. other instruments that created this amalgamated electronica hybrid. I feel like this album accomplishes as much in the first six to seven tracks as the entire album. I felt the back half was weaker, but overall, yeah, I enjoyed it. All right, next up we have an album that I liked a little bit more than you, Jake. This one's Immolation with Atonement. This is death metal, grinding chords, face-melting riffs, drums that try to saw your face in half. So what's not to love there? Well, for some people it's going to be the vocals. I know that bothered you more than it bothered me, Jake. I like the vocals okay, but still I wasn't big on them. They sound kind of demonic and and sometimes even a little cartoonish just with how hoarse and raspy they are. Uh, so so for us, this didn't quite pass the vocal test, um, but you know that goes in hand, hand in hand with the death metal style. Uh, there's just not really much new being added here. I, I will say I like that a little bit more as I tend to be a little bit more of a metalhead, so if you dig that sound, check it out. For our last honorable mention of February 2017, we have Thundercat with Drunk. Gotta say, great album cover. I think Thundercat is <laughs> overall like a kind of underrated artist. This is intricate and flamboyant R&B with incredible prog-like bass. The production and backing instrumentation here is fantastic. I think that this album is fairly impressive overall. You have really great performances in the vocals and backing instrumentation, the keys, the bass, auxiliary percussion, and some fairly strong songwriting with a retro feel. I'm not completely blown away by this album, but it's definitely extremely entertaining. A lot of honorable mentions in February 2017. Just a a handful, about five albums that we don't recommend, and we're going to talk about those right now. All right, we'll start that off with the new Surfer Blood album, Snowdonia. Jake, we haven't really been big on the last couple Surfer Blood albums. Nope. Uh, and this one, even though they're doing more with song structures and, and have several longer tracks, I still just find this to be extremely boring. And what makes this boring isn't just like the surf rock style. I, I mean, you know, the might, the result might be driven by the style, but it's more just a nonchalant attitude towards everything in the music. The vocals lack edge, and the instrumental performances match that lackadaisical vibe. Uh, it's just very simply composed, basic performances that lack the proper energy to convey any sense of purpose. Next, we have Lupe Fiasco with Drogas Light. I, I keep it in thousand, I promise. I'm keeping it honest, I promise. This is terrible. Yeah. Terrible beats, terrible lyrics, terrible delivery, terrible originality. This is terrible music and the worst album I've heard in 2017 to date. Our next not recommended album of February 2017 is King Woman, created in the image of suffering. (laughs) 
Stylistically for this, think of Chelsea Wolfe mixed with Shannon Wright and maybe Esben and the Witch. There's distorted guitars droning on that provide the, the main kind of melody. Uh, they're layered airy female vocals buried in the mix with those guitars and shrouded in a reverbed echo. I actually really, I like the vocal style in general, but but there, I wish there was more going on in the instrumentation or in the songwriting at all for that matter. Uh, this is just a classic example of sound over songwriting, of style over substance. There's just not enough developing here, not enough to really uh, hit it home or, or grasp my attention. Next album we don't recommend from February 2017 is an album that's actually getting a lot of love from pretty much everyone who's not Tom or myself. Yeah. Acceptance with their album Colliding by Design. This is how, what I would classify as generic power pop rock. Big arena sound emphasized in the guitars and drums. Big choruses with big, gleamy electric guitar uh, and, and guitar hooks that are repeated with the vocal hooks. Everything is big here. Process vocals, belting out trite lyrics. If you're into Coldplay or One Republic when they are at their poppiest, you should check this out. It's well executed and performed. It's just not original or particularly interesting to me whatsoever. All right, our last not recommended album of February 2017 is kind of an enigma to us. And this is Jens Lechman with Life Will See You Now. So th this, I almost have to respect this album for how, how bizarre and puzzling it is to me. Uh, it was a struggle. There, there's a lot of good things going on here. Jens Luckman has made a very artistically crafted pop album, and, and there's not enough of that these days. But, but what just about ruined it for me is his vocals. He sings these tracks so mechanically. He doesn't push his voice at all, and every vocal movement is way too cut and dry. It feels like he's reading his own vocal parts from sheet music while he's recording them. This, combined with moments of really horribly cheesy lyrics and just kind of like odd, discomforting lyrics, made this really hard to get behind for me. Yeah, I, I don't think that the lyrics are, are really that horribly cheesy as much as they are horribly weird and out there. And I think that that juxtaposition with the incredibly perfect baritone male vocals is what makes it kind of intriguing. Uh, and the backing musical composition, which is all electronic and beat based, kind of has this like uh, kind of at the beach, almost tropical vibe to it. Poppy, dancey groove. Um, it, it, it makes it kind of fun, <laughs> like fun in the sense that you are really uncomfortable. Listening to Life Will Serve You Now is the musical listening equivalent of showing up to a beach party in a tuxedo. <laughs> Everyone's eyes are on you, but you can still have a good time if you own it. And for some reason, this reminds me just a little bit of Hot Chip. I don't yeah. hate this record. I have to say that. Like, I found myself intrigued by right, it. Right, right. But I don't, I can't say that I like it. It's, it's one that, if you're into really just bizarre pop music, this is something that you should absolutely check out. And it might end up being one of your favorite albums of the year, but I can't recommend it. So what did you think about February 2017, Tom? It, it was, you know, it was all right. There were mostly just albums that I was kind of mad on. Uh, but, you know, it, it had some pretty good stuff in there. Got top three? Uh, I'm definitely Jessica Hoop. Yep. Right. Uh, probably from there, Lowly, and I would go ahead and say Juju. Yeah. For me, I would just sub out Juju with Elbow. Yeah. But uh, my top three, I agree with. Now, the album I hated, I have to say it was Lupe Fiasco. Oh, yeah. For I, sure. I just, I mean, I want those minutes in my life back. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was, it was rough. I'm kind of depressed I don't have those minutes in my life back. I'm sorry, man. What were your top five favorite albums from February 2017? Did you have any major disappointments? Also, were there any albums you found yourself loving that Tom and I didn't cover? Shoot us a note. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you guys for your continued support and participation. Tom and I love all of your comments on our YouTube videos, your Facebook messages, and your emails to us. Your participation is what makes Velocities and Music possible. So, as always, thank you for being awesome. I'm Jake. I'm Tom. We are Velocities in Music, moving music discussion forward. Music.